tonight we have a very special guest that saves lives. Maybe we don't even know it, but it happens. And it's Dr. Dennis Kokinas. We're so excited to have you on the set Thank again. You. It's been Thank you. many years. Um, it has. But we had so many emails about your last appearance. And you are a doctor that does many things. Um, and there's like certain areas that you deal with, but one of the key factors that is very important is colonoscopies. Yes. Colonoscopy um, is very common now, and, and most people, you see it on TV sitcoms, they often have shows about it because people dread it, but it's, it's a very easy test at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, the worst part, as many people know who've had colonoscopy, is the prep the night before. Mm -hmm. But even that's gotten a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, you take half of it at one point and half of it later. So it's not all at once. But once you've gotten cleaned out, then it's all easy after that. We make you nice and sleepy and comfortable. And unfortunately, colon cancer is very common. Uh, it's the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. And colonoscopy has been proven to reduce the incidence of colon cancer death. So that's why it's so well covered by insurance because it's an acknowledged screening test that's more than a screening test. Screening test just looks for cancer, whereas colonoscopy, we remove polyps that can turn into cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just screening, but it's cancer reduction. So when someone does have a colonoscopy and they do have polyps, then that person would come back in, like a normal person that has a clean, right, would come every two, 10 years. Right. So the polyps, are they watch areas? Um, well, the way it, work? it works, so we stratify risk. First off, and this is extremely important, is family history. Mm -hmm. If you have a family history of colon cancer in your family, you should be very vigilant about getting your colonoscopies on time and even a little bit early. In fact, a recent article from the American Medical Association, American Medical Society came out recommending that we consider starting colon cancer screening at 45 instead of 50. We're seeing a shift uh, with younger onset colon cancer, unfortunately. But if you have a family history, that's one thing. Then if you have your index or your first colonoscopy, 35% of men and 30% of women will have the precancerous adenomatous polyp that when we remove it, brings your risk significantly down for the development of cancer. But when you have a polyp like that, that's when we don't invite you back in 10 years, but we invite you back in five years. Mm -hmm. So it's a watch area. So like you said in our little spin earlier, it's really about making the appointment, following up, showing up. Exactly. Yes. And really, it's, it's typically very respectful. Uh, it's not painful because we use anesthesia. It's very safe. And uh, again, it's not just a screening test. Um, and that's very important because there are alternatives to colonoscopy, mm -hmm. such as the Cologuard test, which is a really wonderful test. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit expensive. And if you've chosen to do the Cologuard and it's positive, then you have to have a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes your insurance company will say, well, we've already covered that screening benefit, so you'll have to pay for that. So it's a quagmire uh, what to choose. So how do, what is that test? For the Cologuard is, um, so the Cologuard is a test that came out not too many years ago. And what you do is you have a bowel movement, collect it, and mail it to Rochester, Minnesota, where they test it for a variety of things. Mostly they test it for the evidence of DNA that you would see in a, from a polyp or from a cancer. If you've ever watched a detective show, you know, you sip on something and they take the can and they've got your DNA and they can tell everything about it. Well, as the stool goes around the large intestine, it scrapes against the wall. So if there's a polyp or a cancer, it's going to pick up the DNA. Mm -hmm. And so the stool is tested against an, an index of DNA commonly found on polyps and cancer. And if there's a match, then they say go have a colonoscopy. However, another part of the test is if you have even a little bit of blood mm -hmm. in the stool, even microscopic blood, the test will be positive. So there's a certain amount of false negatives 
And, and I've actually seen cases where a patient had a negative test but had symptoms and we went ahead and did the colonoscopy and found multiple polyps and early cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's not a perfect test, right? but for many people it's a good alternative. Good, and then you do so many other things as well. And mm -hmm. I know as we age, um, so many people do get GERD, yep. acid reflux, many things that, you know, follow that, at, you know, at, probably from taking medicines or whatever it is that we do in life that we get that. Tell me a little bit about that. And right. What, mm -hmm. So GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Mm -hmm. So gastro means stomach, esophagus. So when, when stomach contents, mostly acid, but other things too, reflux into the esophagus, they can irritate the esophagus and cause symptoms of heartburn uh, and, and actually do quite a bit of damage and predispose to a condition called Barrett's esophagus, which in a small percent of, of people can lead to cancer. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just aging, uh, but around 40, many people start to have acid reflux and heartburn. And the other big risk factor that we have control over, we can't control aging, mm -hmm is obesity. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge, huge problem in the United States and in, di in my field, in gastroenterology. It's a big precursor to reflux and to also a very big problem called fatty liver. Mm -hmm. And we deal with that too. So, uh, so it's what we eat. It, it's what we eat. It's, uh, so specifically, it's caffeine. Mm -hmm. um, it's eating late at night and going immediately lying down with a stomach full of mm -hmm. food. It's uh, peppermints, caffeines, what we call the xanthine derivatives. Uh, it's eating too much at one time. So if you understand the principle that f what's in your stomach is gonna come shooting up into your esophagus, smaller meals, eat uh, hours before going to bed to allow the stomach to empty, and then maintain a healthy weight, uh, stuff like that. So this is amazing because uh -huh. it's preventative. So that's something that you can even rectify and change. Yes. Mm -hmm. So to, to speak to the common commonness of it, the most commonly used class of medicine in the United States are the proton pump inhibitors, commonly known as Prilosec, Omeprazole, Nexium. These are the most commonly used drugs, followed by the antidepressants. I don't know what that says about our country, but there you <laughs> have it. Um, in any event, many people who are on these medicines find that it's very difficult to come off because when they do, then their heartburn and symptoms come back. So making these lifestyle modifications, weight reduction, when and how much you eat, limiting caffeine, these are all very important. Unfortunately, there's a lot of literature out there that speaks against chronic use of proton pump inhibitors. And by all means, if you don't need them, don't take them. Mm -hmm. But the studies that are out there are more statistical observations, not causal studies. There's no studies that prove that omeprazole or Prilosec causes kidney disease, heart disease, Alzheimer's, or any of the other many things that have been, in, but you do see that uh, there's a statistical association. But you'll see that because like I said, those are common illnesses and this is the most common used medicine in the United States. So it's, mm -hmm. it's inevitable there's gonna be some overlap. Right, but I think of anything, it's like we know now, you know, maybe what to you know, just, just not use as much. Like, cause we all like to eat certain things and late at night, but you, but you can't do it every night. There are certain times when you do that. Exactly. But, but if you know that these, that it, you know, what it causes, you know, along with the, the other things, you know, not balancing your weight, then, yeah. you know. And that would be a good way, you know, if you realize you have this problem, but it's associated with late night eating or drinking more red wine than usual, then mm -hmm. it would be a good time to use a Prilosec prophylactically, maybe a couple of hours before a big barbecue dinner, right. and, and that would be a responsible way to, to manage it if it's not an everyday thing. Well, and then um, one more thing I wanted to talk to you about when you were talking about the, the fatty part um, is that I've heard so many amazing things about the liver transplants and you know fatty livers and so tell us a bit a little bit about the liver and the diseases and you know what the different types of diseases are. And how okay. to prevent those. That's a so, big one. That's a yeah, big one. Yeah, so you can see gastroenterology and hepatology. Hepatology is the study of liver disease. Mm -hmm. 
We, um, so liver transplants are performed in Charlotte at Atrium is where they do them. And we send uh, many patients there to be evaluated by them and, and to be treated for that condition. Fortunately, not m most people with liver disease don't end up with a liver transplant, but we're very lucky to have a very good liver transplant center here in Charlotte with excellent doctors and surgeons. The more common uh, times we think of liver disease are alcoholism, avoidable, um, although alcoholism is a disease and, and we have to be careful not to be too judgmental, but uh, alcohol certainly. Hepatitis C, mm -hmm. a very big infectious disease problem in the United States and one that was overshadowed for many years by HIV. Currently we have, and, and the treatment for hep C was oftentimes very difficult. The interferon shots, many famous people like Natalie Cole, uh, had it and the the treatment for one year was almost was worse than the disease for many people and the and the success wasn't that good mm -hmm. but today we have drugs that are very safe and it's pills and the the success is 95 to 98 percent complete cure of hepatitis C so That's if you're a baby boomer make sure you ask your physician to be tested for hepatitis C. It's a simple blood test. Mm -hmm. If you have it, there's a cure. And then of course, fatty liver. Uh, this is a big problem. And fortunately in most people does not lead to cirrhosis, but can lead to cirrhosis in a subset of people, mostly the ones who have what we call the metabolic syndrome, mm -hmm. a combination of more truncal, sort of the apple shape. You don't get to tell your body where to put the fat. Right. And so people who have it's that, hard. yeah, <laughs> but people who have that truncal obesity have a higher incidence of high blood pressure, diabetes, mm -hmm. heart disease, and fatty liver. But the more aggressive fatty liver that can turn into cirrhosis versus the more benign fatty liver that some people have. So what are some of the symptoms of liver disease? Unfortunately, like many of the organs in the body, there are no symptoms mm -hmm. until the, the, the liver is so diseased. The kidneys, for example, will work and work and work until you have you know maybe 20% functional kidneys. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden you'll have problems. Same way with lungs. People who smoke and tell you, I have no problem until the next day they're walking around with an oxygen tank because that little bit of functional lung finally gave out. Mm -hmm. The liver is one of the largest organs in the body. And fortunately, it's very regenerative. Mm -hmm. So if you stop drinking alcohol, it won't go back to perfect, but the healthy parts of the liver will regenerate. An interesting thing about transplants, they are now doing, and they have been for quite a while, uh, living donor transplants. So you can donate appropriately a portion of your liver to a child, for example, mm -hmm. and yours will grow back and that liver will grow to the necessary size for the child. That's amazing. It's a fascinating, yeah, That's the liver is very amazing, yes. but we do have to take care of it. And that means getting screened for hepatitis C, maintaining a healthy weight and drinking responsibly. Okay, great. Well, we all know we need to get our colonoscopies. Yes. Baby boomers out there, they need to get their tests for hepatitis C just to make sure. That's right. And the good news is if anything's going on with the liver, it can bounce back and it be, can be treatable. It it, can. And it's we have many, the it's best many. treatment we've had with, for hepatitis C, for example, ever. So it's an exciting time. Well, you are an amazing guest. Thank you well, so thank much. You. And really, honestly, you could have saved a life tonight. I hope so. So thank, thank you. you. We so hope much. you it, hope it's not another five years. Oh. <laughs> I'll see you when it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that means. Dr. Dennis Coquinas, it really could save your life. So you need to check him out. Dr. Dennis Coquinas.